want you to hear from this gentleman who started as a lawyer, trained as a lawyer, and then turned theologian. Went to Covenant Seminary, got multiple degrees. You can read about that in your handout. But uh, I want to give you, and I ask you to give a warm Texas welcome to Udo Middleman. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you all for coming, and indeed this warm welcome, that it was a Texas welcome I didn't realize until... Uh, I was surrounded by it and uh, appreciate that very much. Thank you for the opportunity to address you and to perhaps provoke you to not remain in your reaction to what I say, but rather to continue to labor through some of the points I'm going to make and the uh, propositions that uh, I will express. Uh, as you realize the title of the lecture, uh, The Innocence of God, relates to a book that I published uh, three, four years ago, uh, of which you have, some of you have had, to which some of you have had access and others may uh, want to read it. Um, it is a book that resulted from many, many years of consideration of the essential question concerning the character of God as we live in a world <clears throat> that in so many ways is precisely not an expression of a character of a good God. And the tension that exists between what we read in scripture of a holy God who admonishes us to be holy as he is holy, and on the other hand, the reality of human history is one that raises the question of who can still believe that there is, in fact, a good God. The picture on the cover of the book is from a collection of reminders of the hardship and brokenness of life that Francis Schaeffer had behind his bedroom curtain, so that when you open the curtain in the morning to look out on this beautiful landscape of mountains and pastures, he would not become too optimistic about history and blind to the reality of human suffering. The picture is one of a nondescript person in poor clothing standing inside an enclosure that is created by barbed wire. And he looks outside where the sun shines and the picture's title is, If Only. It is joined by some other articles. It was joined by a picture of a beautiful Hungarian girl standing up against the Soviet tanks in the revolution of 1956. There's an article, there was an article of a parent uh, of a young woman who was uh, disciplined by her parents. She was in her 20s. She uh, decided one evening to go out with a friend and not tell her parents, and when she came back, her parents, though she was in her 20s, scolded her, took her out in order to punish her, and killed her dog in front of her. She was so upset, and rightly so, that she took her own life. And then there were the groups of Jewish uh, citizens forced to wear their yellow Star of David under the Nazi regime in my country, Germany. And these pictures were a reminder to Schaefer that we don't live in a beautiful world. There are many beautiful things in it that are there to rejoice, but there's also the tragedy of a broken, damaged, cruel human reality and a natural world that is not necessarily our friend. That's why I chose that picture as the cover for the book. It is to remind us of the question, how can we still believe in a good God, in uh, the God's innocent? I say that question, I raise that question 
as you may see if you read through the book, because of two observations. The first is that, by and large, in the European theater of world, the world where people lived, people have largely abandoned the notion of the existence of a good God. The 20th century's tragedies, the cruelties of people to people, the extermination camps, the pursuit of ideal new societies at the expense of millions of deaths of individuals, led them to believe that there could not be a good God. Where is God when Auschwitz took place? Especially when in the teaching of the church there had been such an emphasis that God is in control, God is almighty, God is all-powerful, God is all-present. Where was God in the 20th century? We'd been prepared for that, in a sense, that absence of God in the philosophical development of the 18th and 19th century already. And that is that gradually the question of the existence of God was answered with the impossibility of finding an answer, both from the empiricist Anglican, not Anglican, English tradition, I'm sorry, it's not Anglican, it's English, philosophical tradition that after all, there is no tangible evidence of the existence of God. He doesn't come to dinner. Jesus died so many years ago, and even if he was raised, he is now in heaven an absence from our touchable experience. And on the continental side, the rationalists, Kant had declared that you can never reach anything beyond your own perception, which is transformed by what you perceive. It's transcendental in the sense that you end up with a conclusion that for shapes your way of looking at things, but you can never see the thing by itself, in itself. And that epistemological hindrance to knowing something outside of yourself with any kind of certainty was taken away by Kant's careful reflection and gave shape to the perception in the 19th century that really the lasting things, the permanent things, or any real thing cannot be known with any certainty. It's left up to faith. And the result is that we cannot talk meaningfully about a God who actually exists. You cannot touch him, that was the empiricist. You cannot comprehend him, that's the rationalist dilemma. And between the two of them, the 19th century tried to establish something that took the place for the God that the Bible still had talked about, a God who actually exists and who created us. And what they came up with is the dialectic process of history, among other things, the influence of Hegel's teaching that was then translated into dialectic materialism by Marx and Engels, but became the widespread view that somehow the God who the Bible said exists outside of his creation, but in the presence of his creation, could no longer be affirmed as really existing. And instead of that, we have to assume that whatever we had wished for in the existence of such a God must now be seen in that which the 19th century manifested in its progressive development of mankind. After all, you were a little earlier than the rest of us, but you basically defied monarchy and became a democracy. The people took the place of what, where the church had been before, and the monarchs were replaced by constitutional government. Likewise, science replaced the faith of the church. And likewise, the evolution showed us that nature is also progressive, gradually eliminating the infirm and providing life and support and encouragement through those that survive. What the 19th century gave us is the notion of the imminence of God. The divinity is no longer a person who has made us in his image, the way scripture describes it, but rather that history itself, nature itself, society itself, is somehow divine, is the manifestation of a divine purpose. It is progressive as machines were improved, as insight through study gave greater knowledge, and as the hope of independence, emancipation, freedom expressed itself in terms of uh, hopeful uh, divine imminence in the smooth uh, transformation from year to year, from decade to decade. 
He went so far as to believe with the discovery of aspirin in 1896 that the 20th century, four years later, would be a century where pain could be eliminated. That somehow through giving voice to the people we would have a more just society because the kings and the church had been so unjust. Somehow this optimism in uh, the movement through history through the process of conflicts, either in the dialectic materialism of Hegel or in the evolutionary development of Darwin, would provide us with the replacement of what we had lost when God could no longer be touched or believed in because philosophically that was excluded. And so the 20th century broke into, into, come to, came to the light of day with this tremendous hope of the divinity of man, the divinity of nature, the divinity of history, only to open up into the horror of the First World War, the horror of the Second World War, the horror of Stalinism, the horror of fascism, the horror of Maoism, of Pol Potism, and of all kinds of other isms, all in pursuit of a better world at the expense of doing away with the real world of individual people. And so when you look at the 20th century and you see the great hope that was attached to this replacement of God by now seeing God immediately, imminently, in our social, political, economic, technological development, and you saw the result of it in the 20th century, you can see how many Europeans would say, oh, forget it. There couldn't be a just God. There couldn't be a God innocent. Perhaps indeed scripture tells us that God died. After all, Christ died. Perhaps God is indifferent. He is far away. And perhaps God himself is the wicked force behind those things which we believe would be so positive and turned out to be so destructive. That's the one reason. That's the European reaction. Forget about Christianity. All the hope attached to the power of the gospel to transform people and to produce a better life were crushed by the reality of what occurred in history at the hand of people. Unhappily, the church had undermined its one authority by which it could question the whole process, and that is scripture itself. Through the higher critical methodology in the 1860s and 70s, the authority of scripture was gradually undermined. It became a human document to religious aspirations. Mind you, that had its roots already in the Tübingen School of Theology back in the 1830s. In the Tübinger Jahrbücher, the documents they published, Karl Marx was one of the editors. And there, all the supernatural emphasis in scripture is removed and everything is explained naturally. So you don't have the feeding of the 5,000, you have the miracle of unselfishness, because as those 5,000 sat at the feet of Jesus and listened, all anxious to keep their lunch in their baskets for fear that it would be stolen from their neighbor, this little boy, ignorant of such fear, started to eat, and they all saw, well, we might as well get our lunch out as well and share it with each other, and then they were five baskets of bread left over, and that's the miracle of unselfishness. And other things were explained in this way, that's from 1830 on. That's the one side, the European reaction. If you are a sensitive, moral human being, if you're frustrated by what happened, what has been so much the part of our human experience in the 20th century, you cannot believe in the innocence of God. You have every reason to reject it because the church's teaching gave you no encouragement of an alternative. It had undermined its own authority, its own emphasis on a reasonable explanation by appealing to the irrational, by faith in faith, by Kierkegaard's emphasis that only when something doesn't make sense and you believe it anyway, that then somehow it, you, you receive a greater reward in terms of your experience, your understanding, and your self-respect. 
In the 20th, 20th and 21st century, there is a second reason why Christianity has lost its proclamation of uh, the innocence of God. And that is the absurdity of life's circumstances and the failure of so many Christians to respond to it. I don't know if you know the film with Harvey Cartel and John Hurt, Smoke. There's another one uh, that follows it. In Smoke, there is a scene that deals with a life in a small tobacco newspaper stand in Brooklyn. And in Smoke, customers come in and out and they discuss things and talk about the reality of life itself. And one woman paying her what she bought with the right change was able to leave the store without having to wait for the change. And then she went out of the store, a stray bullet hits her and she gets killed. If she had only not had the right change, she would have been alive, is the discussion in the film. When you see that, and many other circumstances like that, and you're faced with the absurdity of life on one hand and the proclamation of a righteous, good, innocent God of these things, then you wonder, how come it doesn't get sorted out? Is God still absent? Has he, in fact, died? Has, beca has God become merely an orientation of personal interest and personal interpretation? How can you still believe in a good God when life has such absurdities as this particular one would illustrate. Mind you, this is not far removed from what I read and what troubles me and why finally one September morning three or four years ago I sat down and this title, The Innocence of God, came to me and I wrote the book in about six weeks. When I heard that Stephen Curtis Chapman had a book written by Ellen Vaughan on the tragedy of their life story where the oldest, I believe I'm citing it correctly, I may be somewhat wrong, but forgive me, the oldest natural son ran over the youngest adopted sister when he backed out his SUV out of their driveway and he ran her over and she was dead. And they were consoled by the fact that God is in control and he only had five years of life in mind for that young girl and isn't she in a better place now and therefore you conclude isn't it all well then how absurd to so pardon yourself with a theology that makes God in charge of everything that occurs in life or perhaps you're familiar with John Piper's report story of about the bridge that broke in Minneapolis across the Mississippi, heavily burdened with rush hour traffic, as well as an excessive amount of cement and sand for the reconstruction or repair of the bridge, it collapsed two or three years ago. And when asked what a Christian should think of this, he said, well, it's God's reminder to all of us that death is all around us and we better, be repa we better rep be repent and be prepared. Or John Piper also saying about the plane that came down a couple of years ago in New York. After starting off LaGuardia Airport, it ran into some Canadian geese. It has nothing to do with their nationality. <laughs> and they broke down the engines and this very well skilled pilot of a US airplane landed the plane on the Hudson River, everybody got out on the wing, were saved, and nobody drowned. You remember that story? Amazing craftsmanship. And wonderful for the people who survived that, all of them. But now, what is to be made of that? Rather than praising the pilot, or leaving it at that, or the tragedy of these geese flying into the engine, and who could have known that? He concludes that it was actually a message from God for all of you because it occurred three or four days before President Obama's first inauguration. And since some here in this country had problems with his election, John Piper suggests it was a message from God to tell you that just as these people were safely rescued from that airplane, 
so also would America be all right under Obama. Or I could continue. Bill Edgar, a professor at Westminster, and one who became a Christian at La Brie, actually, many, many years ago, writes in his book that actually, uh, you know, the person who walked down, happened to walk down a railroad track and was run over by a train in India, where people run, walk down the railroad track all the time, you know, that was probably also God's intention to teach him something. Or you all know that Katrina struck New Orleans because of the, vape, the, the widespread homosexuality. Or Sandy struck New Jersey and New York because you all would know that here, this country of the Northeastern liberals. <laughs> In other words, out of the perception that everything has an intentionality, everything expresses the purposes of God, that somehow there's a divine reason for these things happening is a widespread view amongst us Christians. And I would propose it is fully unbiblical. It isn't that God doesn't act in history. He does again and again. But to automatically identify him with everything that occurs in order to find ways to approve of the most tragic things and thus remove the very notion of tragedy from our vocabulary and from our perception is something that is beyond biblical justification. It is, in fact, a search for security, for approval. It is a longing that things will be all right, and if I can only identify God with all these horrible things that happen, then somehow they must be all right. And I would propose that that is unbiblical, and God is innocent of that. What is behind it, I believe, is something like a conspiracy theory. You're all familiar with that. I mean, those things are rampant in this country. <laughs> but it's the idea. It's the idea that someone way back in the past, or abroad, but in the immediate beginning of a causal chain, is responsible for what happens in my life. And that is true in many ways, when somebody has an accident with you and runs you over, or when somebody steals something from you, or when somebody cooks you a lovely meal. It is somebody's decision to do that. But to assume that all events in history are subject to somebody's original plan and intention expressed in a causal chain that runs through all of history to end on your block in your life is to deny another part of scripture, namely that God has created a world that functions according to its structure, that has a life of its own, not created by itself, but a life of its own, its own kind of logic. The Bible describes it this way, that God created a world and he made everything according to its kind, and then it functions according to its kind without further intervention by God. In other words, I don't believe every apple on an apple tree is put there by God. No, he has designed apple trees which function like apple trees and nothing else. And it's wonderful to realize that we live in such a structured universe where things once created function according to their kind. And of course, human beings functioning also according to their kind as choice makers, and they can mess up all kinds of situations and create all kinds of cruel and horrible situations, as well as wonderful, uh, wonderful things as well. Now, my proposition then is that these perspectives of the second reason why it is difficult to believe in an innocent God is that it is fundamentally a conspiracy theory, that somehow things have to have been planned by somebody, otherwise they couldn't take place. And this someone must be God because we believe in the sovereignty of God and God must be the one who is behind it all. Now the reason for this is of historical length. In many cultural backgrounds, it is, I think, the search for some kind of coherent explanation and the security that nothing is out of place. That when we see something as wrong, objectionable and tragic, it's our mistake to see it that way. <laughs> 
instead of the, turning it around and saying that the, the mind that God has given us realizes that there are distinctions. If, in fact, God is in control, then the distinctions are only in my mind, but not in the real world. And the Bible opens the alternative to our understanding that the distinctions are real. The distinction between normal and abnormal is one of the most central distinctions, and we live in a world in which not everything functions according to the will of God. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we pray that you will be done on earth also as it is already being done in heaven, but not yet on earth. Now, the search for security is that which marks, I would propose, all religions. And what distinguishes Judaism and Christianity from all religions. All religions have in common the idea that you as an individual must submit to the larger whole. In fact, religion comes from the Latin word religiare, which means to attach yourself, to more, to bind yourself to something else, to something that's there of longer duration, of greater power, of more weight. And so you attach yourself in order to be contained, bathed, secured by belonging to something longer. And the Bible says, of course, you attach yourself to a personal God, a loving Heavenly Father. And we'll talk about this more in a minute. But all other religions have a substitute for that, and their attachment is not one to a person who gives you the freedom to be a separate person, a distinct person but rather who asks you to precisely attach yourself and silently accept. All religions tell you, if I may speak frankly, to shut up, lie low, and make do. That is, repeat as has always been repeated. Don't think for yourself. Join the ultimate reality. Lose yourself in the bigger eternity or in infinity. That is the nature of <clears throat> the Buddha teaching, where there is no God, by the way. There is a mindset or a state of being that is Buddha consciousness. And Buddha consciousness is the exercise through which, uh, is a state through which you reach through an exercise of annihilating your intellectual distinctions, your moral distinctions, your experiential distinctions. You join the ultimate unity of everything, with the final description of which is silence. Because as soon as you would use a word, you would distinguish. To say a chair is something distinct, as soon as you've set up all the distinctions to everything else, including cheese. And so the final reality of oneness is silence. In Zen, the refinement of Buddhism, you have the phrase that man enters the water and causes no ripple. He becomes indistinguishable. You join you find a home in silence or death or nothingness. In fact, the pursuit in Buddhism at one, in one of the scriptures talks about the pregnant void of unity. You attach yourself to Islam, Allah, as the single force that controls all of life. That's why you say, inshallah, if Allah wills. Not if you want to or if the tree doesn't get enough water, it won't produce. No, it's all a matter of Allah and his control. In fact, the word Islam means submission and obedience. <clears throat> and there, you don't have a multitude of opinions or a discussion of the propositions in the Quran. In fact, the Quran can't even be translated because it is a divine heavenly language that needs to be repeated in its original form. Of course, you have translations, but these are not the same as the Quran. They are perversions because they're translations. In the repetition lies the value. In the non-comprehension lies the benefit. In the blindness of following is your reward. African tribal religions similarly repeat again and again the expression of their fear of spirits, of their community life, of their role in society without variation, without alteration. John M. Beatty, in his excellent book on African religion and philosophy describes this well. The same thing you had <clears throat> in Russia under a totally secular religion. 
with its priests, its texts, its music, its banners, its marchers, etc., etc. But it was the same submission to the central authority that we're all on this road of history, driven along by conflict to, towards a goal of a perfect society, classless, without any need, need existing because all needs have been met. And you are just a wheel on that machinery. You must not question it, complain about it, or find an alternative. You must not have a mind of your own or explore ideas in poetry or prose. You must conform to the demands of history, to the demands of an inevitable progress, an inevitable advance through conflict, uh, through revolution, through conflict, through bloodshed, through whatever, the end result may be so wonderful that the means to get there are of no importance. It's interesting that the Romans and the Greeks had a similar notion of the fates that control your life. Mind you, Homer still describes life under the control of wicked, unpredictable multitudes of divinities that behave just like human beings except with a little more power. But they were just superhuman beings and created such a chaos as described in the Iliad that uh, life is full of contradictions and unpredictabilities and that obviously didn't suffice. And so the next school of philosophy in Asia Minor, Greeks as well, came up with a notion of something that would give order and cohesion in the proposition that all reality is made up of the four basic elements, water, earth, fire, and air. And that gives you an impression of order. Then you can attach things to definitions rather than leaving it to the play of various divinities. But of course, it's impersonal. It has no passion. It has no beauty. It seeks no justice. They're just stuff, various forms of stuff. And so the next philosophical uh, uh, development is the question of how to come to something that is more than stuff. And that's where you have Plato and Socrates, later Aristotle, talking about the ideals that are somewhere beyond the real, of which all reality is but a reflection, a shadow. And the ideal that we pursue are the ideals of the things that we treasure and we'd like to find, but we only have reflections. Ideals of love, ideals of beauty, ideals of justice, that exists as forms or as ideals somewhere, and we long to get there. What hinders us is the material circumstances in which we live, the circumstances of living in time and space, circumstances of having bodies, and so the platonic idea of salvation, of liberation from these burdens of having to live in this damaged world comes through death. The soul being set free from materiality, through the contemplation of beauty. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians when he says to the Greek, the gospel, the word of the cross is foolishness. He doesn't say it's foolishness in itself, he says to the Greek. And it was foolish to the Greek because he thought he could become a better person by thinking about beauty, by establishing the ideal. And they would take proportionate measurements of the length of an arm in relationship to your eyelids or whatever, and come up with an image of perfection. And the contemplation of that would turn you into a better person. And that's why the notion that actually you are a wonderful human being but guilty and need forgiveness seem to be really uh, foolish. But you also have that kind of merging with something bigger, this religious attachment to something larger, this dependence, this joining into a master plan, whether secular in Marxism or religious in Islam or tribal in Africa or through the denial of your own sense perception in Buddhism, the attempt to deny your own sense perception in Buddhism, you also have that in Calvinism. It's understandable because everybody in the Middle Ages and up to the Renaissance and the Reformation and probably later struggled with the same notions that Paul contested in Colossians and Philippians, and that is don't go down the road of Athens, stay in Jerusalem, 
Don't follow the Greek philosophers, but listen to God's word. And Calvin, like many others, was still under the influence of the Greek philosophers. His first publication as a young man was um, Seneca's work, De Clementia, which he translated in 1532 and dedicated to the abbot of the monastery of the town where he came from, Noyat, in France. It was only three years before he finished his institutes, which he then published in 1536. And the temptation is always to look for security. The reality that scripture talks about, we will come to, is one of precisely unfinished untidiness. And what we long for is resolution, security, and a home, the confidence that we can relax. As Buddha says that, give up your emotional responses to the tragedy of life. Those things aren't real. They're all in your mind. Meditate on nothingness instead. As Islam tells you, it's all the will of God and have confidence that God is good and so therefore accept whatever tragedy, seeming tragedy you face. As African tribes tell you that after all, life has always been this way and who do you think you deserve something else so experience something else? Ex-Marxism Marxism taught that you were on this ride towards a better future that is so bright and wonderful that nothing should be spared to bring it about and everything could be, uh, nothing could be spared to pay for it uh, in order to bring it about. And as the Greeks said, your life is controlled by the fates and by the firmament, by the closed movement of the stars and the sun, the tidal waves that come and go, the cyclical life forms that give the, are the source of all human existence and that give direction for all human existence, it's understandable if you want security, that you would look for some explanation that would bind you into a larger project. And I'm not surprised that Calvin, so close to his own reading and influence of Seneca's Stoic literature, ends up with something that is very similar to the, that kind of determinism, that kind of homing into the providence of God, into God's sovereignty into God deciding all things that come to pass. Mind you, even in the Westminster Confession of the 17th century, it says God has ordained whatsoever comes to pass, the decrees of God, and so forth and so on. And it's easy to see in that the similar, a, re, a reflection of that same uh, dependence on belonging, on being able to finally breathe quietly because everything is okay. It's understandable that then Stephen Curtis Chapman, the tragedy over his family's death, uh, this child's death in his family, would find great comfort in the explanation that it must have been the will of God. But what God does that? What God is behind it? Sure, you affirm the power of God, the controlling power of God, but you have abandoned the moral character of God because he is the author of both good and evil until you become a Buddhist and good and evil no longer exist. I remember a lecture by a Cambridge theologian, I don't remember his name, in which he said, we have moved on beyond what we believed in the past and we now see that God is so great that he is beyond the distinction of good and evil. That's part of our view, part of what we are taught often, part of what we long for. We long for resolution. I long for the kingdom of Christ on earth, but it ain't here yet. Until it comes, we live in a world of deep tragedy, of conflict, of things happening that God is very upset about. We find God's word and revelation, the, the understanding that we must have to live as people, not in history, not in the events of our life. We find them in the declaration of God's text, of his word, of what he says. That gives us the outside reference to judge the events in our life. 
Mind you, it's that outside reference which is difficult to grasp for some people. Uh, Adam Gopnik, a writer for the New Yorker magazine, long-term uh, journalist for them in Paris, writes beautifully, wrote a wonderful book about Paris. He wrote a book called Angels and Ages on the life of Darwin and Lincoln. Two gentlemen that you know about, born in the same year, 1806, both facing out of their Christian training background the tragedy of the death of a child. How can you bring together the death of the child and a loving, caring, compassionate, present, powerful God? Well, they couldn't, and no sensitive person can. If, in fact, there is such cruelty, then either God is to blame or there is no cruelty or a third option I will come to. The option that both Darwin and Lincoln chose is the option to do away with God. They replaced God, in, Calvin's, in uh, Lincoln's case, with providence. And in providence, everything follows everything else into the providence of God, and therefore it's okay. In Darwin, it is nature that replaces God as that which decides what is to live, what is to survive, what is to be eradicated, and it's a natural process. They both have replaced the notion of the God of the Bible with ideas that are much closer to what I've just described as the nature of religion, that is the attachment to something bigger that makes the individual situation acceptable, inevitable, necessary, and therefore, in some way or other, to be accepted. It is also what Job's friends told him. They also told him, life's already fine, and if you suffer much, you must have done terrible things. Because we live in a logical world, in a just world, in, in a world in which you get punished because you deserve to be punished, in which you suffer because you deserve to suffer. You, you just don't get it yet. Repent. And Job has the guts to say, that isn't so. That is not who I am. I do not deserve this. This is out of bounds. And in, guns, in, in, in desperation, when his friends keep insisting that things are all right, you must have deserved it. Job correctly, courageously, and singly calls on God to show up and to explain this phenomenon to them. And God shall show up, does show up. As uh, many others in the Old Testament, they argue with the circumstances. They do not just accept things. They are the moral people who precisely object to this casual unrolling of the force of God or of providence or of nature. They dare to question God, and God shows up and explains, yes, you're right, your friends are lousy representatives of me. <laughs> you know, who has friends? Anyway. But then he turns to Job, too, and says, Job, there's something you also need to know. And that is, yes, you're going through a very, very difficult time. But you weren't there at the beginning when the mess all started and you have no idea what effort has to be put into that to clean up that mess. You want an instant resolution. We know from Scripture that resolution will not occur until Christ comes walking down the street and says, now this insanity will stop, I am in charge. And then there will be no more death and no more tears. Then there will be no more injustice. Then there will be no more absurdity. Then there will be no more stray bullets in the streets of Brooklyn. What the scriptures tell us is precisely <clears throat> a different account. What the Bible tells us is that the Greek thinking dominant in Thessalonica was changed by Paul's teaching there for three weekends. Imagine what he preached about to change the people in the then starting church in Thessalonica to give up their Greek mental horizon of fates of divinities, of controlling stars and such things, of a cyclical view of history. In three Sundays, we're told, 
In other words, somewhere around 17 days, give or take a Saturday and Monday, he had to leave town in a basket because by three Sundays, the people had enough and chased him out. But in 1 Thessalonians, writing back to them, he says, I'm so pleased to hear how you are growing in love, faith, and hope, these wonderful three emphases that Paul repeatedly makes of essential Christian characteristics. <clears throat> but then at the end of that chapter, the first chapter, he says, and I've been told how you have changed from many idols to the one true and living God. And putting your hope in him, looking forward to him, is coming, him whom God has raised from the dead. You put your trust in him and you will escape the coming wrath. Now that's just not a verse. That's a circumscription of a whole change of mindset. And the change of mindset is you have replaced the many divinities of the Greek pantheon to come to the one God, giving a unity to purpose, direction, and moral standard. And this God is the true God, because you can examine him, you can question him, you can find out what he has said about himself and whether he keeps his word. You can find out whether what, is, what God reveals of himself makes sense, whether it's coherent, whether it is logical. He is the true God. It is not a God to be blindly believed, but to be examined precisely. Are you innocent or guilty in the mess of our present existence? And he is the living God because he gave life and he engages himself in a living fashion, moment by moment, with his people and responds to their query and from time to time is able even to do a miraculous presentation. Secondly, you have given up the cyclical view that everything goes round and round, you're locked into position, what the 19th century called, you know, that's your state in life. Uh, the Victorians talked about that, that's your status. Um, you, uh, you are that kind of a person, they labeled them. You've given up this cyclical view that corresponded, that was an, taken from the realization of the cyclical movements of the heavens, heavenly bodies, and the cyclical recurrence of the tidal waves, and the cyclical measures of life that everybody who gets born will also die. That was understood to be the foundational notion of how life is to be experienced. You gave that up, and you're now waiting for something to be different in the future. Tomorrow does not have to be a repetition of today. You wait for what is yet to come, what will yet be made, and specifically, of course, the return of the Lord. The third thing is, whom God raised from the dead. What a wonderful pronouncement on the basis of a historic occurrence that he could occur to a little further east on the edge of the, of the Mediterranean. That's where Jesus was raised from the dead and 500 brethren, remember that, you can ask them. The resurrection from the dead is something that was unknown in the Greek perspective because you were in the cycle from birth to death and that was it, you've had your life. The notion that there would be life that would continue, eternal life, without interruption, by restoration, by resurrection, was a totally new perspective for the Thessalonians, a totally different worldview. And what it gave them, of course, is that if life, in fact, is continuous forever, then every day bears on what the continued life will look like. Every piano lesson that you follow, every recipe that you get to know, every relationship you build, every act of righteousness that you express will have eternal consequences, not in judgment, but eternal consequences. You don't have to start with it later on. And so it gave significance to life, to the individual, to his mind, to his body, to his exploit, to his experiences. It was a real fundamental change in the perception of what life is all about. And fourthly, putting your trust in this resurrected Christ, you would escape the coming wrath, is a statement about the fact that we live in a moral universe and not an immoral one. We live in a universe where things will be evaluated, where things will be judged, where power does not dictate what is right, nor where we just accept everything just because it occurs 
and make it beautiful by saying it must have been the Lord's doing. No, there will be a judgment and therefore we must already discern between good and evil, life and death, rational and irrational realities. That's the biblical perspective. There is an outside perspective that informs us. It is the fact that God spoke. It talks about, it addresses us as human beings with minds. It speaks to us in sentences that need to be understood. It speaks in grammar so that misinterpretation is more difficult. In fact, the Bible alone is the one text that led to an emancipation of human beings from the faiths, from nature, from tradition, from merely being in a timeline. It's a singular emancipation of human beings to responsible freedom. Freedom from natural, from nature, freedom from tradition, freedom from the context of the larger whole, freedom from anything that determines us other than the form that God has given us to be people. We couldn't possibly be an apple tree. And the only thing we ever produce is human babies. That's the first piece of the good news and where Christianity is so radically different from everything else and why I can talk about the innocence of God. The Bible confronts us in the initial stage setting, the description that needs to be understood for the whole rest of scripture to fall into place. The Bible does not start with a way to heaven. It does not start with your need for forgiveness. It does start with a definition of reality into which we are born. And that reality is that eternal is someone who thinks, who decides, who communicates, who is in relationship, who loves, who has passions, who is forever. In the old Soviet Union, when I went there to teach, they couldn't believe that I believed in God. I seemed to be somewhat educated and do you believe in God? Because after all, religion is for fools. And they said, you know, we don't believe in God, but we believe in energy. And I said, well, you're right. There, you know, something has always existed uh, because we don't live in a world in which something comes out of nothing. So something has been there forever. The only problem with energy being forever is that you don't have an explanation how freedom of personality, choice making, creativity, language can come out of the form of energy. Energy just pushes and shoves. And therefore, I agree with you, something is eternal, but that eternal is what the Bible tells us, namely a person, when then a person can make images, make creatures in his image, can make other persons. And so that's what the Bible starts with. The first good news to the person who says, I've given up on God. God is guilty or dead or absent or life is absurd or I'm totally encased in this program, whether secular or religious, is no, that we live in a world in which God, a specific person of a rational character, distinct in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, love each other and communicate in sequence that is before and after, not timeless, but very real as distinct beings. They are eternal in their, in the, the, he is, God is eternal in his characteristics. He is not without them. He is not infinity as such. He is rather infinite in love, in measureless mercy, in me measureless wonder, joy, and so forth. He's passionate in justice, creative, imaginative. Just look at the kind of world he made into which he then placed the first human beings. My point is that the Bible talks about someone who had a mind to create, discussed what he would create, determined the sequence of events when he would create, and then looked at it and said, behold, this is very good. A statement of metaphysical dimension, there is a real world against Hinduism and Buddhism. No, there is a real world. It is beautiful when it was made because it was beautiful and it was good. It was not 
amoral, contradictory, destructive, both containing both life and death. And this God chose to create in sequence, with ever increasing details through the first chapter of Genesis, a defined reality where things function according to their kind, where things are lawful, rational, steady in their existence, a universe of order. And into that he created people from previously created dust, into which he breathed the breath of life for them to become a living soul, as distinct in kind as the other things were distinct in their kind. And this human being is made in God's image to have dominion, to relate, to love, to explore, to create, to be passionate, to name, to discover, and to create real history. In other words, what Genesis 1 and 2 describe is not that God is in total control, but rather he sets something in motion into which he continues to act, of which he has continuous pleasure, but in which the human being made in the image of God in a derived authority is able to create new things, such as a marriage. It wasn't there. They created it. Such as babies. God didn't create them. Man and woman created them. Such as different kinds of apples, I imagine, weren't there initially all in their variety. I know in our lifetime there have been new kinds of weird fruit <laughs> created. So what I'm saying, what the scriptures tell us, is that God is not the one who created a universe which now functions by itself, or that God never experiences something new. The Greek notion of perfection was that nothing new could be added, because that would imply <coughs> imperfection, incompleteness before. According to the Bible, there is a God who thinks and acts in sequence, in time that way, if you see what I'm saying, in sequence. He created not by a whoom, there it was, but rather in six distinct periods of time. There was a gradual in increase of details, of particulars, which turns the reality of our creativity into something that is a pleasure to God, intended by God, and to be valued as our activity and creativity. In other words, those babies of Adam and Eve were only there because Adam and Eve chose to have them. And God was equally pleased. Now that's very important because that's a totally different perspective. That means that history is very real. And by the time you come to the third chapter, in the creativity of human beings, we unhappily mess things up. Because we there create evil. The choice that Adam and Eve had was not between good and evil. It was between standing and enjoying the love of God and each other, or no longer enjoying the love of God, breaking up that relationship to God, and then breaking up that relationship to Eve by accusing her immediately that she was the one, and so forth and so on. And from then on, the rest of Scripture is the description of the ongoing history of sadness, of tragedy, of healing, of wonder, but always looking forward to the restoration and never being satisfied with the time of day as we experience it today or with what we have done so far. And thus we cannot say <clears throat> that everything that occurs is according to the will of God because God's response to Adam and Eve was on one hand a deep disappointment, but remarkably, God does not judge them immediately and say, you go to hell. You are terrible, useless, and unworthy. Instead, what my Bible in the third chapter of Genesis says is that God immediately runs, Adam and say, uh, runs after Adam and says, where are you? Which is not a question of ignorance, but rather a question posed to a person that needs to become aware of what they have done. My mother used to say, when I did something naughty, and I came home, and then she'd say, don't you have anything to say? <laughs> I found that terrible, but it, it makes you realize what you have done. And that's what God does here. 
The amazing wonder of Genesis 3 is that God does not reject the human being. He continues to be in the image of God. He continues to be valuable. And God sets in motion every effort to get back to work in order to restore what had gone so wrong. And we find God running after Adam, calling him forth, telling him they've got to get their act together and mustn't accuse each other. They have now a hardship to experience, but they must resist it. They are in depression and think that now it's done for good. No, there will be a child born of a woman who will be the redeemer that will crush Satan's work, and there will be a restoration. In the meantime, thorns and thistles will come over, but you can learn the trade of actually resisting that. Don't accept it. Argue with the new circumstances and seek to do that which is right and good and supports your life and does justice, etc., etc. And the whole emphasis and the prophetic words in the Old Testament and the teaching of Jesus and the life of Jesus and the reminder of these things by the Holy Spirit all come together as a constant encouragement to object to any kind of resignation, any kind of determinism, any kind of closure at this present moment. We are not to be satisfied, not to see things as meant to be, not to see them as somehow intended for us and for our benefit, but rather critically analyzing them from the high standard of God's word and understanding this is out of place. This needs effort. We need to resist this. That's what God immediately did when Adam rebelled against him. That's what Adam is encouraged to do against the thorns and the thistles. What they're going to do, to, what they're encouraged to do together against the death, the physical death that would come years later. Because they hadn't had children yet. See, they had to wait a while and then children had to be born and raised sufficiently to become independent. And then Adam and Eve would die. But the emphasis there in chapter three is that God encourages them precisely to get on with multiplying so that there would one day be the woman who would give birth to the Messiah. The whole, the whole emphasis is one of critical evaluation, not acceptance, of standing up, not lying low, the very opposite of resignation, making an effort, being entrepreneurs in that sense. And the scriptures remind people of that in the prophetic word and in the life of Christ. When people today say that everything is in, comes from the mind of God, God is sovereign, he sees everything, and therefore I must learn to accept because it's in our best interest, or that God intended me to learn something, we make the mistake of assuming that everything that happens in a tragic world where there is a cause and effect reality, and where people do all kinds of nasty things, including nasty neighbors, and we to our neighbors, in that kind of a world there isn't always an intention from God. There is no direction from God. God is innocent of such reality. Instead, he clearly exhibits his character in fighting for that which is good and just and of life and for redemption. That's what I find in the life of Christ, the express image of the Father, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. I don't find the mind of God exhibited in what people do to each other or whether I stumble over a stone, or whether my child dies, or whatever. I don't find the mind of God there. I find it in God's Word and in the living Word, where Jesus comes to earth to express in physical reality, in historic circumstances, what is on God's mind. And it was a life of protest. Protest against the insane understanding of Scripture amongst some of the Pharisees. Protest against sickness and disease. Protest against death, even though Lazarus would be raised again, only to die a second time because people were jealous that he had so many viewers. Uh, you know, what you find in the life of Christ is precisely not Mother Teresa's habit of holding people's hands and comforting them. No, he came as a warrior to fight against sin and the effects of sin, to teach us to seek justice rather than resignation, to engage in confronting evil rather than seeing it somehow as of some divine inspiration and purpose. Now, having said all that, I realize that in some of your 
biblical knowledge and teaching, you will have heard things that seem to contradict that, such as God has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. Well, I believe that in the sense that God has ordained a world in which choices have consequences. There is no escape from the consequences of ideas and actions. That is ordained. We live in a rational universe. Isn't that wonderful? That's how we can practice science, because it's a predictable universe. You figure things out, and you can come back tomorrow, and it'll still be true. That is what God has ordained. The Joseph story, when the Bible in chapter 50 of Genesis says that you, the brothers, intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Oh, how easily one sees there that somehow in the workings of the brothers is already God's intention. So then further back, is it in God's intention that, that uh, Joseph got that colored coat and was such a naughty boy showing off before the brothers as, ha, 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 my mother is the favorite one and got his brothers all riled up so that they want to put him in a ditch and then make some money of him, sold him to Egypt? Was that God's intention? And further back, and how far are you going to take that back? Is it not that what the brothers had in mind, namely to get rid of this naughty little beast of a brother, God turned around by an extra intervention through a dream, for instance, by which Joseph was able to interpret for the Egyptians what God would do so that he would be wise. It isn't that the whole thing was intended by God. It's rather God is able to act into all kinds of situations here and there, and in this way did it there in Genesis. Or the ninth chapter of Romans, where it says, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. You know, what, how are we to understand that? Well, is that a selection process of God's determining who would be his? Well, not the God who runs after Adam and never talks about hell in that kind of a context. What he talks about is, I have a way to redeem you. I'm willing to work an extra day. You know, he's worked six days and then he rested the seventh, not because he was tired, but because he wanted to enjoy what he had made. And then Adam messed it all up, and so God decides to go back to work, all the way to sacrificing his own son, to the Trinity being combusted, exploding, so that the sun is darkened and the uh, curtain is torn and the earth quakes because the very foundation of creation is intention. Uh, God works to create that, uh, to, to interfere for us. So what is to, how is that to be understood? Well, if you read Romans 1 through 8, it is the account of our, all of our need for salvation because we've all done things we knew to be wrong. We've all broken the standards we ourselves apply to ourselves. The Gentile, his standards. The Jew, the standards of God. So we are both internally, vis-a-vis -vis ourselves, guilty. There's none righteous, no, not one. But now God has found a way to be both just and the justifier through the death of Christ, the separation from his son. So that the separation I deserved and I was in has been repaired, paid for, by the separation of the second person of the Trinity from the first and the third. And the first Romans 1 through 8 goes through this and points out our guilt, God's work, the provision of Christ, and then the life by the power of the Spirit in chapter 7 and 8. And then there's a summary of that at the end of 8, and that is the gospel. And then chapter 9 picks up a different thing. It's a question that anybody from a Jewish background would have in their mind. Well, if there is only one way of salvation, if both Jew and Gentile is guilty, if both Jew and Gentile is saved through the work of Christ, what on earth is special about being Jewish? Well, that's what chapter 9, 10, and 11 address. What's special is that through them we have the covenant, through them we have the law, through them, we have the Messiah, that child of Abraham through whom all nations will be blessed. Jesus Christ came through the Jews. That's what's so special. And that's what Paul talks about in the beginning of chapter 9. He sums it up then by saying, 
Therefore, I loved Jacob and hated Esau. I loved the Jews because of these things. That's what he's talking about in that context, as I understand it. It's the Jews that were saved from Pharaoh, not Jacob. He was dead by then. It's through the Jews that the Savior came for the whole world. It's the Jews that now need to come to the Savior themselves in chapter 10 and 11, and that Christian that was grafted into the tree, etc., etc. And the whole thing is summed up in its own conclusion at the end of that section, as there was a conclusion at the end of Romans 8, and that is the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The promise to Abraham there would be a savior, the promise to Adam and Eve there would be a woman giving birth to a child, specifically then in the covenant to Abraham through the Jews, is what Paul talks about in the ninth and 10th chapter. It is not God's shopping trip on any level of righteous decisions, uh, etc., etc. He has a right to make his own decisions. No, it's on the basis of God being willing to invest a whole nother day of work to redeem us. When I say it that way, in parenthesis, you should perhaps know that Christ was raised on the eighth day, the first day of the week. That's when the work was finished. That length of day it took for redemption to be paid for, to be laid the foundation of what redemption is. So, summing it up, I can believe in the innocent of God without having to compromise by doing away with the reality of tragedy. I don't have to be the Buddhist who says, oh, it's all in your mind. I don't have to say it's all part of a program that just sort of runs along and I just have to place myself on the wagon to be pulled along. I don't have to compromise God's power by holding on to his holiness. I don't have to compromise his holiness by holding on to his power. The Bible allows me to look at God, to understand God in the context of these tragedies that I've mentioned. Uh, exemplary in the 19th and 20th century, but you can go through the whole human history. The awfulness with which we have treated our neighbor, the religious wars, the neglect we've expressed, the classification of society, the neglect to, uh, uh, you know, the breaking of covenants that we had with the indigenous American citizens, those what I call Mongol Americans, because they came over from Asia uh, in the 1830s under the, under Jackson and others. You know, the violation we have uh, experienced with the misuse of guns, the cruelty we express in our present society with not paying our employees sufficiently, the neglect of children and their needs for guidance, direction, love and care and attention. And all these things, are these all part of the expression of the mind of God, of the will of God, of the purposes of God? But the Bible alone, with the perception, I, with the perspective I have tried to bring to you, allows me to complain about all these things and hopefully to repent of the parts that I have done but all over to grieve for it without having to say they were part of God's plan or God overlooked them. These are terrible things. I mentioned earlier on that the attraction to finding a resolution, you know, a master plan, whether of the Marxist dialectic historical form or of Islam or of the extreme form of Calvinism that everything is decided by the will of God and therefore we just better accept it because uh, we would really be even worse off if we didn't. Um, all these give you an illusion of security in the arms of a God that is not innocent but is indifferent. In light of the reality we experience of these tragedies, our reaction should be one of revolt, one of opposition one of critical engagement. We ought to be the Elijah that goes to the government and says, in the name of the God whom I serve, you're wrong. We ought to be the Paul who says, you would have no right to beat me. I'm insisting that you pay for my passage to Rome. I want to go there anyway. We, are the, we ought to be the ones who are opposed to all these wrongs and evils the way Christ was when he got, came to the world as an expression of the Father, 
not tell us to approve of the things that happen, but to seek the lost child, to, the, the lamb, to heal the sick, to pronounce justice and peace, and the hope that we have that one day there will be the security of resolution of the kingdom of God on earth, of the return of Christ, of the resurrection of the body, and of life being able to be lived once again the way it was intended to be lived before the fall of Adam and Eve. When all the efforts we put into life will be required, but will be without interruption and without frustration. When we will continue to grow, to develop, to engage, to create, etc., etc., as human beings. For our calling is precisely not to follow the Greek notion that the best thing is beyond leaving the body behind, the pursuit of the ideal, etc. But what we are called to be is to be human beings made in the image of God in a space-time reality of physical, spiritual existence, of eating, drinking, making music, writing books, discussing issues, and digging the soil. That's what we look forward to. And only when that occurs, when Christ comes down the street and says, I am now in charge, away with sin and its consequences, can I rest at peace and say, then is the will of God done. Thank you very much.